Easter weekend. We come to church on this Sunday morning and we talk about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The power of death, hell, and the grave. But I had a question when we start talking about that resurrection. We talk about Easter and what does the resurrection mean? Because we could talk about Jesus conquering death, hell, and the grave and three days later coming out of the grave and we could sing the songs about the resurrection. But what does it mean? What, what's it going to do for me when I walk out of this church service to know more facts about Jesus dying on the cross and Jesus rising from the grave? Those are all biblical doctrinal facts. And we have to have that for our salvation. And we need to accept what Jesus Christ has done for us. But what I want to do today is I want to take the power of his resurrection. And I want it to collide with the authority of the humility of the cross. What does it look like when you see the humility of Jesus, the extraordinary humility that Jesus came and he died? He humbled himself. He put upon himself humanity and put upon the sin of the world on his back. He humbled himself. On Friday, he was crucified. He put himself in a position of extraordinary humility. And then three days later, we see the extraordinary power of the resurrection. In three days, we have seen the humility of God and in the power of God. What do we do with that? What can I tell you? What can the scripture share with you to say, what, what does that do for me? How can I take an application and take it from the scripture pages of the Resurrection Sunday and put it into my life that when I walk out, I can apply it. I can use it. Well, I think when we look at those, there's a couple things that have taken place over this last week of Jesus' life, right before the resurrection, that are very imperative that we talk about. The first one, we talk about the humility of Christ. They were in the upper room, and, and the disciples were talking about which disciple was greater, and, and Jesus getting ready to be crucified, getting ready to know what's going to take place. He looked at his disciples. He said, for three years I've been talking to you. For three years I've been sharing everything that's taken place. So he gets off and gets up and, and gets the basin of water and bows at each one of their feet. Dirty, stinky feet. Wearing sandals. And he washes their feet. And then he said this. He said, the master is always higher than the servant. The servant is not greater than the master. The leader, the positional power, is always higher. But do this. If you are a leader, if you have that power, submit humbly to those that are below you. Humility. How many of us in our school in our homes, at our jobs, in position of authority, have people that are below us. Even in even our homes, those that are in the, in the birth order, those that are first born, they have pecking order. If you're a coach, if you're on the basketball team or a football team, everybody has positional authority. If we take that authority and we use that authority with arrogance, what we have done is we have positioned ourselves as better than those that are underneath us. We've all seen people with power with no humility. Anytime that we have power without humility, arrogance takes over. Every time. Anytime that we have humility without power, what we have done is we have secluded what we should do because we do not have God's power within our life. We must collide the power of the resurrection, humility of the cross, and come up with what God wants for our lives. Even when God sent his son to this earth, he sent his son to do his work, to do what God needed him to do. Jesus had to submit 
to God. He came to this world, became man, took upon sin to die on the cross for your sin and mine. So, there's a scripture found in Philippians that, uh, that Paul wrote. And Paul was not a follower of Jesus Christ during Jesus Christ's life. Paul became a believer after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. But Paul writes uh, two-thirds of the New Testament. And Paul wants to tell us, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, if you have the power of God within your life, I want to give to you an example that you can take as a believer with the power of God, with the humility of the cross. If you can do these things, I guarantee you everything we're going to work out for your life. But here's the example. Let's look in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I want to read a couple of the verses and then talk about this a little bit. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others better than himself. What, what that's saying is, is, is if we have power, what we must do is when we look and we talk to individuals, we can't look at us and say, I am better than you. I am more important than you. Anytime that we look and act like we are better or we have more or we have more influence and we look down at other individuals, we have lost the very characteristics of Christ. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and meekness. What we must do is when we look at somebody, not with conceit, not look what I have, but what can I do? Looking at others with a pure heart. Look at what God could do. Look what God wants to do. We have, we have God over here. And God is this all-powerful God. And we on this side, and we are a powerless individual. We all have things within our life that we cannot have victory over. When these vases, let me get an illustration here. Yeah, that didn't work. Oh, that one worked. I needed to have a broken vase. What'd I do? Here, good. This is our life. I want to take your life, your life as a broken life. And we're sitting over here and we look at our life, just like Bonnie. She took her life in her own hands. And when you take your life in your own hands, we want God to take care of us. We say, God, do this. But we always try to take it back. Every time we try to take it back. And we're sitting over here powerless and we're saying, God, will you, will you fix me? I, I know that you can fix me. And he says, okay, I'll fix you. Let me have it. We give it to him for a while, and then we take it back. But here's what God does with our vase, or with our life. He takes it down, he looks at it, and he says, your life is now under my power. You've given your life to me. You've accepted the gift of salvation. Your life is now mine. Your vase or your life is under my power. What he does with that, he does not create the vase the way the vase was made before. Because the vase is broken. But he puts your life back together. And in that vase, he has to change some things. And there's going to be some scars, some nicks, some tears. It may not look the way that you want it to look, but it's the way that God created your vase to be. Because in our powerlessness, we broke. In our sin, we are broke. But in God's power, he can fix anything. It may be broken and scarred, and it may not look the way that you want it to look. But here's what we do in our society. We have a, a bike that we, 79 bucks for a bike, and the chain breaks, and the tire goes flat. What do we usually do? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. You be quiet. That doesn't fit my illustration. <laughs> what I do is, if it's broken, it's a $79 bike. I throw that bike away, and I go buy another throwaway bike. 
Or if a TV gets broken, you bought that TV for 79 bucks, it was on sale, you don't take that to the TV shop anymore, you go buy another TV, you go to Walmart and buy another TV. Here's what we do. We throw broken things away. If it's, well, some people, some people just put it in the closet and pile it up, pile it up, pile it up. But most people throw broken things away. Here's what God does. God never uses anything until it's first broken. And once we are broken and we say, God, I need you to fix me. God takes our life, takes our vase, the scars, the hurts, and the pains. And he says, now you can be my vessel. You, what good is what good is this ugly vessel? You, do you know what the scar means? And do you know what I did here? And do you know it, it doesn't look like I want it to look? And we have no idea what our vase is going to be used for. But when we use our life and we give our life to an all powerful God and we understand we are powerless in our sin, what He does, He lifts up our life. And he starts sharing our life with people. And then they start licking up their vase and their life. And they start looking at their scars and their pains and their hurts. And you look at the vases and you start saying, my vase is kind of like your vase. And God brings vases and lives together that are broken, that are scarred, that are hurting, that are struggling. And we have to remember my life, I am powerless. I have no power. But I have somebody that has all power. And he's just asking me. He's saying, come to me with humility. Give your life to me. I will fix those scars. I will heal those wounds. I will forgive that sin. And I will give you my power. My power. See, the greatest thing about God's power, after Jesus died on the cross and he arose, 40 days after Jesus arose from the grave, the day of Pentecost, the power of God, the Holy Spirit power, came upon the disciples. And the day the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, thousands of people gave their life to Christ. They had the very power of God. Daily, people were added to the church. Daily, these men, one day they were hiding in the upper room, fearful of their life. The next day, they walk out to the streets and they start proclaiming the name of Jesus. And they even say, the man that you crucified, I am speaking of him. And daily, people were giving their life to Christ because of that power. Jesus wants us to accomplish the goal for Christ with the power of God. But those disciples, they didn't turn around and it wasn't about them they used the power that God gave to them to communicate about Christ. When we have humility, coupled and collided face to face with the power of God, what happens to us is awesome. It's found in the next verse. Let each of you look not only for your own interest, but also the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we are going to be followers of Christ, we have to take on the very attributes of Christ. And the very attributes of Christ is this. It's not necessarily always about you. God wants to use you. The, the, the day of Pentecost, the church was established. And thousands of people gave their life to Christ. He used his power to accomplish his goal and his power became individual power. He gave each and every one of us the Holy Spirit of God to allow God to work with his power. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this attitude. What is the attitude? The attitude, if you are a follower of Christ, serve. Look at people with respect. Understand that God may be using you, your broken vase, your broken life, your scars, and all your imperfections to help somebody see Jesus Christ. 
well, I'm not a preacher and I don't know a lot about the scriptures and I really, what if they ask me some questions and I really don't know all the answers. You know what? <laughs> Neither do we. If somebody calls me on the phone and says, hey Bruce, what's the Bible mean about this? I say, just a second. I just get on my computer. I Google it. Let me tell you, okay, it says this, this, and this. Nobody knows all the answers. God does. What we have to do is we have to be a vessel, an instrument that God can use. And in that vessel, that imperfect vessel that God wants to create and use for us, that is the most extraordinary humility wrapped up in extra extraordinary power. And it equals an extraordinary love. Now, how do we get that love? Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What we have to do is we have to start looking at people through the eyes of Christ. We have to start looking at people not as better or worse, but as an instrument that God wants us to minister to. If we can start looking at people as Christ does, not I am better than, or not that I am worse than, but I am here to minister. The power of the resurrection, the power that God gives to us is love with humility. There's no greater love than a brother to lay down his life for his friends. There's no greater love than what Jesus Christ did for us. The Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, he came to this earth. And when he died, he was thinking of me. He was thinking of you. Jesus leveraged his humility with his power. He leveraged that for a purpose. That purpose was for you and me. See, we think about the resurrection and we think about the cross. You know, the Bible says when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he could have sent 12 legions of angels and they could have taken him off that cross just like that. But Jesus said, Lord, your will be done, not mine. He stayed on that cross for your sins and mine. He humbled himself. And there's some type aspects of humility that's very difficult to do. Humility is by nature hard to do. By nature, we are selfish. By nature, the first thing we think about is me. What am I going to get out of it? What do I need to do? Humility is think about him. What does Christ want me to do? And as a believer, what we must do is let our mind be in Christ. Let us follow Christ. Humility is I will do what Christ wants me to do. When we see people that are humble, genuinely humble, there's a couple things that have taken place within their life. First thing is their vase has been broken. I, I've never seen a genuine humble individual without junk being in their life. And God allows the junk in our life to break us so he can use us. If we had this beautiful vase and we tell everybody how beautiful my vase is, man, it's gorgeous. It's very expensive. I love it. It's awesome. You ought to be like me. Because I'm perfect. I'm good. This is my life. Don't you wish you had my life? If you had my life, you'd be much better. You're looking at that guy and say, what an idiot. <laughs> Go talk to yourself. Nobody else wants to talk to you. But if you walk around genuinely, let me tell you what God did for me. And I was, I was goofed up. I didn't know what I was going to do and I didn't know what to do the next day. I was addicted to this and I had sin with my life and my family was falling apart and I just, I just said, Lord, I need your help. He asked me to give him my life and I did. I know it's not perfect. I know there's some scars. And, but I couldn't have done it on my own. There's not a person in this room that would not sit and talk to that person 
that through his humility he's been broken and he just wants to share his life because of God's love. How is that? The humility of the cross. The power of God through his resurrection gets to be the point of extraordinary love that God allows my spirit and your spirit to collide to share the love of God. We have one job. As believers in Christ, we have one job. And that's to reflect the very nature of God. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. If we want the blessings of God, we want the attributes of God, we must first be humbled by God. Now, going through the brokenness part of your life is not a fun part. It's a necessary part. Because after your life is open, God can put that vase, your life together. It'll be better. It'll be quality. People will communicate to you in ways that you can't even comprehend because God put it together. Extraordinary humility. Extraordinary power brings it together when they collide. The love of God within your life nobody could fathom. The God wants to give us. Is your life, is your vase goofed up? Can you mark, look at your, scar, look at your vase and see the scars? Can you look at your life and feel the pain? Can you look around you and say, I really don't know what to do. But could you be like Bonnie as well? And you try to give it to him two or three times. Yes, Lord. But then you say, nah, not, not this one. I've been to the altar before and I've prayed and asked God to forgive. But I, I, I just keep on going back to the same old. And I, I don't have a change within my life. Let him take over. It's not easy. Being humbled before God is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. But it's the most necessary thing in order for God to take your brokenness and take your life and take your scars and use them for his glory. What if, what if I said at that time, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't, I don't want people to know my junk. I don't want people to know my scars. I don't want people to think that I don't have it all together. And that's where the church fails God miserably. Because we come into church on Easter Sunday morning with the facade on. Everybody looks good, which means everybody's got, got it all together. And let me do a survey, if you'd be honest with me. How many of you guys have a broken vessel. Our lives are goofed up. How many of us are willing to be humble enough to let God fix them? The question we need to have is, am I humble enough to give my life to Christ? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you with all humility. It is so hard to give our life over to you. It, we are selfish by nature. And you created us this way. And so you know. But you want us to be humbled and have our own will that we will give our life to you. So Lord, I pray right now that you will touch our hearts and touch our lives. And in the pains that we have, I pray that you will just allow us to give them back to you. And Lord, we need you for our salvation. We accept you because of what you've done on the cross for our sins. And we thank you for that. We are humbled by that. But we also see the power of your life. And the joy that you can give to us. And fix our life. And forgive us of our sin. And to give us a purpose. A destiny. Wrapped up around your will. So Lord, just be with us. And we love you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Uh, before we go on.